Something new is happening on the moon. The year is 2050. Humans are scratching out a living despite the merciless conditions. Sun, hotter than the Sahara. Shade, colder than Antarctica. And a life-sucking vacuum that kills in minutes. But in the rugged wilderness of the lunar South Pole, on the rim of a crater, twice as deep as the Grand Canyon, bustling settlements sprout out of moon dust. Corporations and nations compete against one another, exploiting the moon's resources for profit, science and military advantage. This is not science fiction, because people are already making it real. Around the globe, human beings are preparing themselves for life on the moon. Welcome to the future. The moon has been transformed from an alien world into an extension of Earth. The first human outpost on another world. And our first decisive step towards becoming a spacefaring species. But whose moon is it? India, China, Japan, Russia, Europe and the United States all want in on the action. Falcon 9 is the most powerful single core vehicle in the American fleet and when Falcon 9 heavy... Not to mention entrepreneurs. Today there are 1,200 billionaires on this planet. And what it used to take a large government agency to do, a small group of dedicated individuals with the right computational capabilities can now do. Private or government, foreign or American, to get to the moon this century, everyone must overcome the same set of hurdles. Because there will be nothing on the moon until humans put it there. No shelter, no transportation, no food and water, no electricity, no spacesuits, no landers, nothing. Every person, habitat, vehicle, nut, bolt and scrap of food must be lifted off the earth and transported 400,000 kilometers through space. Step one for getting back to the moon is the most difficult getting this unprecedented load out of Earth's gravity. Escaping Earth's gravity is kind of like climbing out of a well. And you start out at the bottom of the well. And it's going to be a lot of work to climb your way out. NASA calls its new moon program Constellation. Plans call for not one rocket, but two. People will travel on a small rocket, called Ares-1. Everything else needed for lunar settlement will be transported on a larger rocket, Ares-5. This monster will stand nearly 120 meters tall, the largest rocket ever built. Go. Together, these two rockets will be able to lift twice as much as the giant Saturn V rocket of the 1960s. 15 seconds, guidance is internal, 12, 11, 10, 40 years ago, during the Apollo program, it carried astronauts and all their equipment to the moon. But the new Ares 5 will carry 10% more. Instead of having a maximum payload of about 48 metric tons that the Saturn could deliver, you can probably get that up to about 54 metric tons, which means that you can have a larger landing vehicle, you can take four 
crew instead of uh, two. Uh, just a whole bunch of additional advantages uh, for having that larger payload. But designing two new rockets can take years and lots of failures along the way. So NASA's not going to start from scratch. What we've come up with is actually to use heritage systems off the shuttle and Apollo, which number one, gives us a lot of reliability data. We have a lot of experience with flying those, so our likelihood of failure goes way down. The first stage of the crew vehicle, Ares-1, is a solid rocket booster. It's the same one used on the space shuttle, but extended for more power. The second stage has an updated version of the 1960s Apollo engine. The heavy lifter, Ares-5, will be powered by two of the same larger shuttle boosters and a cluster of five main engines derived from the ones used on another large rocket, the Delta IV. NASA engineers have spent 50 years making their launch system safer and more reliable. But tragic accidents happen. Engines beginning throttling down now. When the shuttle Challenger blew up 73 seconds after launch in 1986, there was no escape system. No way for the astronauts to survive. That's a design decision NASA's determined not to repeat. The new crew capsule, called Orion, looks a lot like the old Apollo, only larger. And like Apollo, it will have a way to save the crew from disaster. On Orion, we actually have a, a launch escape system, launch abort system, that allows us to abort at any phase during the launch. The launch abort system is another small rocket mounted on top of Orion. If something goes wrong during launch, the abort system's powerful engine can fire instantly, pulling the capsule and astronauts clear at 1,000 kilometers per hour. For several seconds, they must endure the sort of high G-forces normally experienced by fighter pilots before parachutes open, returning them and their capsule to Earth. As of today, NASA's aiming to have Constellation's lunar program designed, built, tested and ready to launch in 10 years. Final launch readiness poll, VM. VM is go. PLC. PLC. It's the year 2020. At the Kennedy Space Center, the Orion capsule and its crew of four are just seconds away from heading back to the moon. Ignition, we have ignition, we have left off. Once off the launch pad, Ares 1's first stage solid rocket burns for just over two minutes, pushing the Orion crew capsule through the air at over 6,800 kilometers an hour, more than five times the speed of sound. We're coming up on stage one separation event. The spent first stage then separates, and the second stage fires, carrying the spacecraft to an altitude of 134 kilometers above the Earth. We have confirmed bearing separation. No longer needed, the launch abort system is jettisoned. Orion's service module engine takes it into low Earth orbit, 320 kilometers above the planet. Orion then unfolds the solar panels that will supply power. The first step of the new lunar mission is almost complete. The people have left the Earth. Now they need their equipment. Ares 5 blasts off next, carrying everything the crew will need for step two, getting to the moon. But to do that, the two rockets must first execute a critical and dangerous maneuver, rendezvous. All this open. It's 2020. Human beings are heading back to the moon. The Orion crew capsule draws ever nearer to the giant Ares 5 cargo ship. Finally, the two vehicles dock safely. 
Now it's time for step two to begin. The engine on Ares 5 burns once more, pushing the crew up to 39,000 kilometers an hour. Enough to slingshot them out of Earth's orbit and onto the moon. Four days from now, they'll look down on a surface area as vast as Africa. So, where should they land? The Apollo missions went to the equatorial and lower latitudes because those were very accessible from Earth. The uh, lower latitudes are easier to get to from a, a rocket point of view. The moon's equator is also flat and relatively boulder-free. And since no Apollo crew spent more than three days on the moon, having enough light was never a problem either. They landed in the lunar morning, and a lunar day lasts for two weeks. The problem is the lunar night, which also lasts for two weeks. Astronauts can live off solar power for around 14 days. But then, they'd have to find a way to survive 14 days in darkness. And it's not just dark. It's cold. Minus 150 degrees centigrade four times colder than Antarctica in the dead of winter. And without solar power, it could be deadly. The astronauts must find a reliable source of power. You know, the best place that we could possibly go on the moon, if we're engaging in a frontier approach to space, where we're going to get there and build and grow something, are the poles. The moon's orbit exposes both its north and south poles to virtually continuous sunlight. Bathed in that sunlight, almost exactly at the south pole, is Shackleton Crater. But there's a problem. The Shackleton Crater's steep walls are twice as deep as the Grand Canyon and climb to a ragged rim. No pilot in his right mind would attempt to land there and its uncharted territory. The perfect graveyard for a spacecraft. NASA engineers don't want a repeat of the first lunar landing in 1969. Few watching at the time realized it was a near disaster. A hundred meters above the surface, Neil Armstrong discovered his lander was heading for a field of large boulders. Four and a half down. Five and a half down. He quickly looked around for a better spot and manually steered his way towards it, Four forward, drift into the right coming level. within 30 seconds of running out of fuel. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, you got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. The last thing NASA wants is for the new mission to face the same problem. So step four for getting back to the moon is to find a safe landing site. But right now, the best maps of Shackleton Crater aren't detailed enough to reveal any large boulders that could cripple a spacecraft. To avoid that scenario, NASA will soon launch a new satellite called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO. If it works, the LRO will produce high-resolution images, the first step towards pinpointing the best landing site at the rugged South Pole. Okay, let's wheel it over. The camera on the spacecraft will be able to photograph individual rocks less than half a meter across. The LRO is also fitted with a new laser altimeter that will help reveal the shape of those rocks by collecting topographical and temperature data to create 3D maps. Red and yellow mark steep or rocky danger zones. Green means flat and smooth. It's 2020, day eight of the journey bringing humans back to the moon. Thanks to the LRO, they're already armed with a map to the best landing site. The Orion capsule has brought the crew over 99% of the way to the moon. 
but the last few kilometers will be among the most treacherous of the journey. For that, they must transfer to a completely different craft. Step five, to return to the moon. Design a craft that not only can land four people safely, but house them for a week. This is the first full-scale model of the lunar lander Altair. Design engineer Clinton Doris's job is figuring how four astronauts can live out of this confined space for seven days. You see we've got one of these bunks set up. There would be three bunks vertically here and then somebody that sleeps on the floor in essence. But this gives us the opportunity for all of our food storage and equipment storage. We've got storage here for our umbilicals. We've got a restroom facility, so to speak, but this is where all of the activities occur. With cabin space so limited, the astronauts will have to ride down to the lunar surface standing. Check, check, check. Okay. It's designed to fly only in the moon's reduced gravity, so Altair could never be realistically tested back on Earth. Turn on, turn to the left. This will be the first and ultimate test of how it performs as it negotiates treacherous slopes and deadly boulders. And no one has even attempted to land in a place like this, on the edge of a lunar crater four kilometers deep. We suggest getting back at five plus four zero. In 2020, the lunar lander Altair is on its final approach to the moon. But this landing site is a far cry from the Sea of Tranquility, where Neil Armstrong touched down over 50 years earlier. This is a slender ridge near the yawning abyss of Shackleton Crater on the moon's south pole. It's surrounded by some of the most intimidating terrain humans have ever laid eyes on. Crater walls plunge down four kilometers, twice as deep as the Grand Canyon. The low polar sun creates glare and confusing shadows that makes navigation difficult. Worse still, the moon has an unpredictable gravitational field that could throw them off at the last minute. At last, the astronauts feel the reassuring bump as Altair touches down near the crater rim, site of the future lunar outpost. Go up to the uh, crater. For the first time in 50 years, Americans once again set foot on the moon. Here I am, folks, in the middle of the boulder field. Harrison Schmidt is one of just 12 Americans who have walked on the moon. I think the biggest surprise for me was just how beautiful the place was. Here's this brilliant sun that's illuminating everything like you were in the high mountain country of the earth or in the deserts, but the sky's black instead of blue. That blackness hides a stark truth. There's no atmosphere on the moon, only a life-sucking vacuum. Humans wouldn't survive here more than a few minutes without one of the most complicated pieces of technology ever devised, the spacesuit. Bob, what do you think? Can I read a gravimeter? Nothing less than a wearable miniature spaceship. The suit must deliver air to breathe, warmth in the shade, and cooling in the sun. The Apollo suits of the 1960s were rigid, bulky, and only good for a few days. So, step six of the new mission is to devise a spacesuit that can last for several months and is easier and more flexible to move in. That's a unique challenge because it's like inflating your tire. The more air you add into the spacesuit, the much more stiff it becomes and much more difficult it is to move. So that's a definitely a design challenge that we have to overcome. Even the gloves are inflated with air, making it hard to bend your fingers. Oh, man. You're talking about very stiff, unforgiving gloves. And not only do they wear your forearm muscles out very quickly, but it can also cause trauma in various parts of the hand. And we have to do much better 
with the next uh, generation of spacesuits. And figure out a better way to put them on. Unlike Apollo, the next generation of astronauts going to the moon will be able to slip easily into the back of their spacesuits. This will cut prep time for a spacewalk from several hours to just 30 minutes. The Apollo suits seem to work well at first in the moon's reduced gravity, just one sixth of our own. I'm getting it right now. I won't. Ah. But they turned out to be top heavy. No. What our data is suggesting now is that uh, we, we definitely want to get a center of gravity that's close to our round. A punctured suit could have been lethal. Luckily, it didn't happen. The guys were falling down a lot, actually. We analyzed the videotapes, and two to three percent of the time, they were either falling down or getting back up. But the falls caused another problem. And so their suits got very dusty and dirty, and then they didn't have an airlock, so they had to climb back into the lander, and they got all that dust all over the lander. Moon dust is deceptive. It preserves a footprint like fine powder. But under the microscope, you can see it's made of particles as jagged as glass. Worse still, it's statically charged, clinging to virtually everything. A deadly menace to equipment, machines, and even people. So, yeah, we don't want to breathe dust. No question about it. What do we do about it? Well, the primary source of dust in a habitat would be the suit. Leave the suit outside. But for astronauts to leave suits and dangerous dust outside requires step seven, a permanent outpost. To build that, they'll need supplies, lots of them. Delivering them is another job for the Altair lander, which flies unmanned when carrying cargo. These cargo flights deliver the vehicles and materials needed to set up the lunar outpost. NASA is already testing the prototype lunar rover that will be used to transport construction materials. But the outpost itself is still a work in progress. Engineers are evaluating many different types of habitat design. We've looked at what if we had just one large module that had maybe 500 cubic uh, feet of, of space to house four, four astronauts. <laughs> or if we had smaller tube type modules to build a larger facility. If something should happen to one module, you could quarantine it off and the crew could stay safe in the other modules. The big concern is weight. Habitation specialist Robert Howard evaluates a design that's both light and compact. We're now inside the inflatable torus this is a mock-up of one of the systems that the Lunar Surface Systems Project is considering for, for living on the moon. If you notice the curved outer wall and the beams that represent an aluminum core, you can kind of think of this as an inflatable donut. When complete, the habitat would look something like this. A lot of people wonder, why are we looking at inflatables? They think of these as just big balloons, and why do we want to play with balloons? Its outer shell is actually made from a durable Kevlar-like fabric. It's extremely rigid, it's stronger than aluminum once it's inflated, and it's designed to be able to compress into a small area, but yet expand into a large volume once deployed on the surface. It'll take several hours for the habitat to inflate to its full size. It expands outwards from a central core containing the electrical and life support systems. Along the curved outer wall sit storage units, as well as work and lab stations. An identical adjoining unit houses the crew's living and sleeping quarters. Entrances are fitted with airlocks and magnetic filters to keep out dust. But engineers have an even more lethal lunar hazard to contend with, radiation. Cosmic rays traveling from distant parts of the solar system constantly bombard the moon. 
and the sun unleashes streams of highly charged particles during sporadic eruptions called solar flares. You go up there with even a spacesuit, and you know, if there's a solar flare, you could be dead. Well, what else you wanted to do here? Get on the rover and leave. During their few days on the moon between 1969 and 1972, the Apollo astronauts suffered no ill effects from radiation. But many believe they dodged a bullet, something residents staying several months can't count on. We have the ability to bury those outposts in lunar regolith, shielding, radiation shielding. A jacket filled with regolith, the troublesome lunar dust, forms a dense barrier which absorbs cosmic rays. While inside, a water wall shields astronauts from the higher energy radiation periodically produced by the sun. So they'll go inside, inside the protective confines of the water wall, and there they'll wait out the storm, just kind of like a tornado shelter in the Midwest. It's now 2024, four years since humans returned to the moon. Over multiple missions, the lunar outpost has gradually grown in size, allowing its occupants to live and conduct scientific experiments for up to six months at a time. But they're still totally dependent on regular cargo shipments from Earth for all their supplies. If the outpost is to survive, they must find a way to begin producing their own oxygen, water, and other basic necessities. Flying all the basic necessities to the lunar outpost every few months is simply too costly. So humans must take another approach. It's very important that when we return to the moon, that we do it with a mindset that is based on a frontier approach, a mindset that says, what can I do with the resources and materials that are here so that I don't have to bring them all the way from the Earth? So, step eight for the moon dwellers is to find those resources locally. Surprisingly, one place may be right underfoot. I got your geology training did come in handy. The only geologist ever to wield his hammer on the moon is Harrison Schmidt. You learn where to hit rock. That's it. He and other scientists recognize that the same dust or regolith that poses such a threat to astronaut health and equipment also contains a treasure trove of valuable minerals. Copy that. If you heat that regolith to, say, 700 degrees centigrade, some of it will react with the oxygen in the minerals of the regolith and the glass of the regolith and come off as water. An intense effort is now underway to learn how to extract these riches within the lunar regolith. Back on Earth, a NASA team is experimenting with a new process on the slopes of Mauna Kea volcano in Hawaii. We found that the soil at that site is relatively close to the chemistry of the soil of the regolith on the moon. They're working to produce not just water, but oxygen. This dust, which will be several inches thick on top of material like this on the lunar surface, is the product we are mining in the beginning of our process for utilizing resources on the moon. They test out an experimental vehicle designed to turn pulverized rock into oxygen, hence its name, Roxygen. So what we're doing in Hawaii, we have a rover that scoops up some of the soil, dumps it into a hopper. Inside the vehicle, the soil is heated to a temperature of 900 degrees centigrade. The metal oxide in the soil reacts to give off water vapor. Within this water vapor is the crucial element, oxygen. When fully developed, the Roxygen system will consist of an autonomous rover fitted with a scoop. The rover will transport the lunar dirt to a conversion plant, where the water produced is separated into hydrogen and oxygen. So, the resources for humanity's expansion, once we get up there irreversibly, will come from this uh, lunar hardware shop. But those critical resources are found only in small quantities out on the exposed slopes. 
Scientists believe more abundant reserves may lie in the South Pole's deep, dark craters. They're coal traps. They're permanently shadowed areas that, that trap uh, things like water ice. It might have come from comets. Regolith, these early moon dwellers will still have to use resources sparingly. Astronauts will live in a tightly controlled environment that keeps waste to a minimum. Over 90% of the water they consume is recycled, which means that the coffee they drank yesterday morning will be simmering in tonight's soup. Their environmental and climate control system removes excess carbon dioxide and moisture from the air. It recycles the water and pipes the CO2 into the greenhouse next door. Once we are able to get access to oxygen and water, there will be the ability to grow food. You'll bring seeds. Then we have to bring some nitrogen and you'll grow foods. And the oxygen produced by photosynthesis from that food is returned to the living quarters. It's now 2040. And through a deliberate series of steps, America's established a permanent outpost on the moon. And like any new settlement, this outpost needs a fresh wave of immigrants. So that we can keep going. And so that we can take that beachhead that they create on the moon and expand it into new communities, new activities. Other nations and businesses will quickly follow, moving beyond the South Pole in search of profit or a strategic edge. The things that we fight wars about on Earth today are metals and mineral rights, energy rights, real estate rights. Those are the resources that are in space. And on the moon, the real race for our nearest neighbor is just beginning. It's 2050, 30 years since humans returned to the moon. Regular ferries now operate between lunar orbit and the Shackleton spaceport. The original outpost has grown into a lunar city. Commercial domes, processing plants, hotel towers radiate out from its center. It's hard to believe that all this sprang from a single module delivered by an Altair cargo flight just three decades earlier. And the Shackleton crater isn't the only place where humans have landed. Over the horizon, China and India have also established their own lunar bases. One of the most fascinating things is going to be the race for which government and which societal structure will have predominance in space. Thoughts like these may have spurred today's travelers. This flight is filled with business people and scientists here to help take the final step of the lunar mission, creating a self-sustaining economy. That's how civilizations expand. And we have to do it in a partnership wherein the government helps support and catalyze the development of activities that can eventually pay their own way. These new arrivals have their work cut out for them. One critical need is an abundant source of power. Without it, a self-sustaining economy will be impossible. The RG is on? Yeah. Good. At the University of Houston's Nanotechnology Lab, Alex Freundlich has an idea for turning one of the moon's greatest threats, its lack of an atmosphere, into an advantage. Can you press that up? His team develops highly efficient solar cells, which generate electricity from sunlight. Here on Earth, these cells can only be produced in a vacuum created by constant pumping. But space presents other opportunities. Now, all this uh, machinery is utilized to create a vacuum of the size of probably a few inches in diameter. Whereas on the moon, I mean, we have that on hundreds of thousands of kilometers naturally made. Experiments in this miniature moon vacuum reveal something else. The lunar regolith, 
or layer of moon dust spread over those thousands of kilometers contains all the raw materials to make solar cells. It just needs to be collected and processed. So Freundlich's team has designed a robot. Using solar power, it first melts silica in the lunar surface to create a layer of glass. It then lays down a grid of solar cells on top of the glass. Putting multiple robots to work can transform thousands of hectares of the lunar surface into vast solar farms. Because in many places it's always sunny, they can provide enough power not just for the moon, but for the Earth as well. David Criswell, also with the University of Houston, has an ambitious solar energy plan. Export that surplus power from the moon back to Earth. The basis to deliver commercial power back to Earth would be about 30 to 100 kilometers across. And they would be located on the two edges of the moon. So over the course of a lunar cycle, one or the other would be illuminated. So it's the perfect place, in fact, the only place that we can cost effectively gather enough solar power to run our planet. These vast solar arrays convert the electricity into microwaves and then beam them to terrestrial receivers. They won't turn a passing aeroplane into a microwave oven. Its metal skin shields the passengers. And over 80% of these microwaves can be converted back into electricity, making them highly efficient. Another proposal for supplying the Earth with lunar energy suggests using the lunar surface in a different way, mining it for a rare form of gas, helium-3. Once you have lunar settlements uh, in place, more than likely their primary source of export income will be by sending helium-3 back to Earth for use in fusion power uh, electric plants. Nuclear fusion, where helium-3 and hydrogen atoms fuse to give off energy, like the sun, is still largely theoretical. But many feel the process holds enormous potential. Just 50 kilos of helium-3 could power a city the size of Atlanta or Helsinki for a year, with little of the radioactive waste of conventional nuclear power. In the meantime, other minerals promise a quicker return for the lunar economy. There are trillions of dollars of platinum and gold and precious metals from asteroids that have impacted the moon over the last four and a half billion years. If that's true, robot miners can plow up these valuable minerals without risk. The dead rock of the moon supports none of the Earth's fragile ecosystems. Just over the horizon from the lunar city lies the moon's far side, which always faces away from Earth. It's a place scientists can't wait to get to, not for development, but for studying the rest of the solar system. The backside of the moon is the quietest place for radio astronomy to be found in the solar system. We can't get that kind of quiet on the surface of the Earth with all the radio noise that we have around. Here, a giant radio telescope can peer into the remotest corners of space, searching for clues to how the galaxies and the early universe formed. This thirst for knowledge drives humans, but so does our desire for fun. By the middle of the 21st century, the lunar economy caters to a growing stream of tourists, ordinary people willing to pay a premium for the first true off-world adventure. Why not wake up in your bed feeling six times lighter than you do on the Earth, roll over and look out the window at that beautiful little blue-green orb and go down to the rec field. That rec field and resort are housed in a giant dome. Just imagine a pole vault in one-sixth gravity, or a high dive six times higher than the highest high dive on Earth and what could happen before they hit the water. But what's really interesting is you can strap on a pair of wings, flap your arms, and fly. The oldest dream of humanity 
realized. And to old dreams inspire new ones. There is a solar system out there waiting for human beings to enter it and to figure out how to use it to our benefit if we can. And I'm convinced that we can. Throughout history, the moon has mesmerized humankind with its silvery mystery. It's an alien world, and yet it's close enough that we can discern its individual features and feel its tidal pull on our oceans. Whoever builds the rockets, the vehicles, and the systems that take humans back to the moon, whether it's NASA, China, or private industry, the venture will usher in a new era. Space will no longer be a hostile place that we occasionally visit. We're going to be seeing ourselves not as just one world, the Earth, but the Earth and moon together as a system. And between, we'll have orbiting hotels and facilities. We'll have cycling ships that just do figure eights between the Earth and the Moon permanently. The Moon may soon become a testing ground where we hone exploration skills, develop the technology to harvest resources on more distant planets, and begin mapping out our future as a spacefaring species. By going back to the Moon, we prepare ourselves for more ambitious journeys. Journeys that may ultimately take us to Mars and beyond.